prepare for the next talk, which is going to be about um, the, the patient's perioperative journey. And, and Andrea Waitson uh, uh, is our skull base specialist nurse. She's got a huge amount of experience in really guiding patients through the whole process, um, which is so important, particularly for these rare diseases um, with potential significant uh, morbidity uh, associated with them and stresses on, the, on these patients and their families. So um, we've already heard how uh, complex these tumours are to, to treat and that patients can present with a variety of, of symptoms that can potentially cause neurological disability and therefore there can be a significant psychological impact for these patients. As nurses it's our role to ensure that both the physical and the psychological care of these patients is optimised. Uh, we feel that uh, high-volume high centres with um, subspecialist multidisciplinary care is the best way to treat these patients. So we've already heard that patients do present with a variety of symptoms, but symptoms can occur not just because of the tumour, but, but also because of the treatment. Often patients get headache, um, and in the, peri the post-operative period, patients often get pain related to the surgical approach. Um, patients may have a variety of cranial nerve deficits, most commonly the sixth cranial nerve, uh, although they can have uh, lower cranial nerve deficits. And if the brainstem is compressed, they may have some gait disturbance. So it's important as nurses that we feed patients into uh, the appropriate therapist at the appropriate time throughout the perioperative period. Uh, and patients, although they rarely have preoperative endocrinopathies, they may develop endocrine dysfunction uh, in the post-operative period um, related to uh, the, the pituitary transposition. So um, it's important that we have holistic views of looking after these patients, particularly because the diagnosis, um, uh, the symptoms that they live with and the treatment can cause severe fatigue and uh, anxiety alongside the physical symptoms. Um, there are very few quality of life studies that look specifically at skull-based cordoma and chondrosarcoma, although the ones that are out there do suggest that these patients do have lower quality of life scores compared to the general population. Um, often predictors for poorer quality of life include those who have severe pain and have gait disturbance. I think it goes without saying that those with more complex needs, for instance, those who require cranial cervical fixation, those who require tracheostomy, have dysphagia issues, are going to have a poorer quality of life. Though again, in this particular group, it's very poorly studied. There are a cohort of patients who will actually have an improvement in their quality of life, particularly if pain is an issue and surgery goes on to improve the pain. And perhaps as clinicians, we should ensure that quality of life is higher on the agenda when we're trying to make treatment decisions with patients, particularly given that survival is improving. So we, we want patients to come into surgery in both uh, an optimal physical and a psychological position. We manage the symptoms throughout the perioperative period, but we also ensure rapid access to psych oncology and uh, neuropsychology services. And within our own unit, we have uh, dedicated neuropsychologists who we are able to um, get rapid access to through um, clinics here at Salford Royal. Equally, our patients are offered an intensive counselling session with ourselves as the specialist nurses in the weeks building up to the surgery. We offer information, we offer um, counselling and, and just general information on what to expect in the post-operative period. We reiterate the aims of the surgery so that the patient has a full and thorough understanding of what to expect and also the risks. And we find that this intensive counselling does actually have a positive impact upon patients' anxiety levels. And there is evidence that these types of preoperative sessions can actually reduce inpatient stay and they can uh, positively impact upon identification of complications and reduce morbidity. And of course, these are malignant processes, so we do want timely treatment, but patients have to be guided in the fact that there are investigations to arrange in the preoperative period. We want to ensure that baseline endocrinology, visual assessments, etc., are arranged, even if the patient doesn't have symptoms, um, and also appropriate imaging for staging for metastases potential, um, and just to ensure that the uh, operative imaging is of uh, all sorts of prior to the operation and patients don't always understand why surgery can be a little bit delayed whilst we are 
uh, getting those investigations arranged. So it's important that we guide our patients and inform them of the need for these investigations. There are a cohort of patients who will require cranial cervical fixation when instability is present or is expected. But it's important that as nurses, we are guiding and counselling our patients as to the potential side effects of cranial cervical fixation. And some patients, particularly in the younger age brackets, are opting out of cranial cervical fixation because they favour quality of life outcomes they would prefer to um, um, avoid limited range of movement or the potential for long-term arthritic issues uh, versus um, the potential oncological control. And it's really important that patients have clear, thorough information for both the immediate post-operative period and the long-term implications of either having the cranial cervical fixation or not. Post-operatively, well, we often see patients have a fair level of pain particularly those who have an endonasal approach tend to have a lot of uh, sinus pain and headache. So it's important that we understand the level of pain and the type of pain. We find that anti-inflammatory pain medication is helpful in this, pain, in this patient group uh, beyond the first 24 hours. And often uh, there's nasal fullness, nasal crusting, nasal discharge, and it can be quite uncomfortable for patients in the early days. So nasal care, salt water irrigation, and just describing to patients what they will, uh, what they will experience is important. There are some patients who will have wounds if they've had a, a cranial approach, or if they've had fixation, or if there's been a flap. Um, and it's important that we both describe to patients what this will feel like, ensure that they know about wound care, and make sure patients are actually managed in the post-operative period in an appropriate ward that is used to managing these neuroscience patients. It goes without saying we want patients to be up and mobilising early to avoid any other uh, related issues such as deep vein thrombosis, chest infections, etc. And then for the cohort of patients who go on to develop endocrine issues following the surgery, it's important that um, the nurses and the ward staff that are looking after these patients understand the signs and symptoms of complications such as DI and SIADH, and that patients understand the need for such investigations and why we get endocrinology involved, particularly because there is always the potential in the longer term for endocrine dysfunction following proton beam or other radiotherapy techniques. Information is key, so we always have a, a pre-discharge session with the patient where we give them written and verbal advice on signs and symptoms to look out for when they go home, what they should avoid doing in terms of straining, blowing their nose, avoiding any pressure on the flap repair, avoiding the risk of a CSF leak, etc. And also signs and symptoms of potential complications. And for some patients, they will have therapy needs. So if they've got um, gait disturbance, we need to make sure they're seeing therapists whilst they're on the ward and that they're being referred on to community teams. We have a supportive network MDT here within our unit with lots of uh, specialist allied health professionals, psychologists and ourselves as the specialist nurses who sit and discuss these cases and ensure that we can optimise patients' uh, therapy needs and psychological needs. Um, in the perioperative period, both pre-surgery, post-surgery and during radiation treatment. Um, there are a small number of patients who will go on to develop eustachian tube dysfunction uh, due to manipulation and um, this can be quite a debilitating symptom. So we do advise patients on management of this and referring to ENT if the need is uh, required. Often patients aren't able to drive and this can be quite an impact upon them socially. Um, so some patients who are going back to work, it can be uh, quite difficult. So a lot of information is required in this perioperative period. And of course, fatigue is something that we see most patients experience and they've often not even recovered from that before they go on to have their radiotherapy, which can also impact upon this. Um, we know that those who have got recurrent tumours and are having revision surgery have got high risk of complication, but we do see cerebrospinal fluid leaks uh, in both groups. Um, and also meningitis in a small number of cases. Thankfully, we rarely see stroke or vascular insults, but there is always the potential for these uh, disabilities and these can impact upon patients' um, recovery in the long term. So it's important that patients have a full and thorough understanding of the potential risks of surgery and also that when they're going uh, home that they are aware of the signs and symptoms to look out for and that we are liaising with the community teams to identify these issues early and reduce any morbidity associated. 
In the longer term, we have often transfer care quite quickly over to the radiotherapy and proton beam uh, units. So it's important that we're liaising and communicating with those teams, talking to them about uh, the patient's particular needs. For those who've got um, numerous recurrent uh, numerous recurrences, they often want to talk about emerging therapies, so we should ensure that they've got access to experimental medicine services and that we're guiding our patients on what to expect and what may be available. It's obviously, obviously important that patients have ongoing psychological care and symptom management, and often that is through uh, a combination of consultant and nurse-led clinics in the longer term. And for those that have recurrence, there is a question uh, about whether more dynamic treatment uh, is appropriate for those who've had multiple surgeries and radiation treatment. Um, there is a line uh, to, to, to find as to whether these patients should go on to have further dynamic treatment or whether quality of life is actually uh, more important to them and whether best supportive care is, uh, is the best way forward. So as nurses, it's important that we have these open conversations with these patients um, and that we consider all options.